May the 19th over Hindenburg line, striping balloons. One hour, ten minutes at 10,000 feet. Hit balloons, but they did not go up in flames. The observers jumped out with their parachutes when they saw us coming. We were very low, and we were fired upon at everything the Hun had, including flaming onions, which go up to 3,000 to 4,000 feet, did side loops, etc., and usual stunts. Strafed by commanding officer for stunting after the patrol and for not having the machine inspected for damages. This diary passage, later to become part of his biography, reads something like a book by W. E. Johns, only this wasn't fiction. The pioneering aviation exploits of Kiwi Captain Malcolm McGregor, better known to the public as Mad Mac McGregor, are truly mind-blowing and from my perspective had to try and fit in with the average attention span of a youtuber that's to say 15 minutes this therefore is just a taster my boy's own annual let's get into the pre-flight paperwork malcolm charles mcgregor was born near hunterville in 1896 his parents ran a farm and he got sent to hamilton boys high for the benefit of overseas viewers, Kiwis are right into what school you went to. Unless, of course, it was a bank robbery. Anyway, when WW1 broke out, he wanted to enlist in the army, but his folks said no way. So he stumped up the money to train to be a pilot himself, and a year later he walked out of the New Zealand Flying School in Mission Bay, a fully-fledged pilot, which were in high demand in France, in Belgium, etc. at the time. The overall situation regarding fighter pilots at that time during the war is better covered in an earlier video I did. New Zealand's first fighter ace, the dashing Thomas Culling. I will place one of those bubbly things at the end for you to press on. Suffice to say, you wouldn't get a successful application for life insurance any time shortly. McGregor was soon on a boat to England and ensconced with the 54th Squadron in France after advanced training in England at the beginning of 1917. It was to be a short excursion into the action with the 54th Squadron, shooting down an Albatross a D3 on the 6th of June, then regrettably crashing his Sopworth pup on the 29th, smashing his face up rather badly when it tipped over. The Air Force wanted his family to know of his situation and he was in hospital back in England, only McGregor told them he didn't have any family and chose instead to send a letter back to his parents, who weren't exactly keen on him, as you remember, and his brother being shot at. Before I read the letter out, and kindly note, his brother was also convalescing in an English hospital at the time with shrapnel wounds. Well, here I am in hospital. Had a crash the other day. Uh, through engine trouble and got down all right, but the machine turned over and my face came in contact with the gun. I do not think the authorities sent you a cable, as I told them I did not possess any relatives or next of kin. Thought perhaps you'd had enough to worry about. Mac was keen to go straight back into action. The Royal Air Force, though, they had other ideas and they decided to put him to good use whilst he was recovering. He became an instructor, a reluctant one, and being high needs, became rapidly bored being away from the pointy end of the conflict. To break the boredom, he undertook a couple of legendary madcap exploits above England. When I say above, in the second case, we are only talking 10 feet above. Well, earning his nickname, number one was completing a mock strafing run on Windsor Castle. Yes, really. Then seeing how close he could get to the surface of the Thames River. The figure of 10 foot being what the police report said. All of this naturally didn't go down too well, according to his superiors. This and his uh, penchants for undertaking banned aeronautics saw him whisk back to the action in France where he had more of an opportunity to kill Germans than the English populace or himself. It's fair to say the strapping 6 foot 3 Kiwi was a bit of a loose unit. He's easy to spot here. Second on the left. If the goat mascot looks a trifle odd, I've done two previous videos about New Zealand forces mascots. That cat's called Snowy by the way, always good to put in a video bumps up numbers. Both those videos, number one and two, are in the description down below. It was now May 1918 and Mad Mac could get amongst it with the 85th Squadron 
rapidly being promoted to captain and getting his own flight. He was in his element. May 18th chased Hun machines, but they were too high and went too far over lines. Probably acting as decoys with Hun scouts above to dive on us. Nothing doing. Practice spins. Like the new machine very much. That new machine he mentions in his diary is one of these. An SE 5A. The more alert of you will have seen it behind him in the other photos of him. If you want to see one in the flesh, the real thing, or at least a replica, you can go to the Vintage Aviator in Masterton. He was now in his element. Between the 29th of May 1918 and the 27th of June, McGregor became an ace, scoring four kills or drove downs. Drove downs basically meant that he sent the plane plummeting out of control. July and August, he would add another four to his tally of five, earning himself a distinguished flying cross. Whilst in the process of getting shot down and surviving unscathed, his last kill was an observation balloon in October of 1918, into double figures as the war petered out. Back in NZ in 1919, Mac went back to the family farm and the next year he purchased his own dairy farm near Hamilton. Grew rapidly bored at the same time and turned to motor racing for his adrenaline rush, having some success on his Harley. His first post-war flight was in an imported Austin Whippet flying off a homemade strip on his farm, June the 5th, 1921. Probably fair to say, the first flight to occur taking off and landing in Waikato. This flight lives in legend, not because of the novelty of Hamilton's citizens having an aircraft buzz the city, rather for something he didn't do. That was fly under the spans of this bridge the Hamilton Railway Bridge. I hate to disappoint people, myself included. In his memoirs he makes specific mention that he thought about flying under it, but then thought better as the plane wasn't his. And then, to rather contradict himself, he said he did try to get as close as he could to the surface of the river. In 1925 he married Isabel Postgate, and they would go on to have two boys and two girls. And things weren't going too well on the farm though. He was forced to sell it the same year and went back to manage his parents' farm. During this period he kept his hand in with the flying, being a founding member of the New Zealand Air Force, gaining his commercial pilot's licence and starting an airline in 1929. Hamilton Airways. I bet most Hamiltonians went aware at one stage they had an airline. Their fleet to start off wasn't the biggest. A single de Havilland gypsy moth, like the one you're looking at in front of you. And still they, they being him and another ex-war pilot, really got around the country. This last report alludes to over 1300 trips being made. Meanwhile, the depression dug deeper and deeper. Even with three planes, Hamilton Airways went bust only 18 months later. Undeterred, McGregor had another crack at flying mail, this time between Auckland and Invercargill, flying a Simmons Spartan. That's not his one, by the way. The photo, however, is from New Zealand and it's taken above Christchurch. You'll notice a parachutist being dispatched. McGregor also flew at air shows around the country, working in tandem with skydivers doing displays. It's important to mention here, McGregor saw the potential for aircraft to be used exclusively to fly cargo and mail. He started New Zealand Aero Transport, possibly the first what we would call courier service in New Zealand, hardly nationwide. It flew weekdays at Christchurch, Dunedin in return. The bloke was certainly way ahead of his time. Meanwhile, things back on the farm weren't going so well, and neither were his ventures into commercial air operations. There was no money about, and he needed a proper job. This came in the form of the chief instructor at the Manawatu Aero Club. As a bit of a side story, when I googled Milson Airport, Palmerston North, I came up with this amazing photo from February 1933. That's Kingford Smith's Fokker F7, a Southern Cross, crashed on their runway. 
Don't look for the strapping McGregor in the photo though. He was in hospital at that time with a broken back after undertaking a daredevil act gone wrong at the aerodrome opening the year earlier. They'd suspended small balloons, about twice the size of your standard party variety, over the runway and McGregor was swooping along and trying to pop them. Somehow I can't see the organisers at Warbirds over Wanaka rushing to recreate this. Now, after spending six months in hospital, he was about to undertake another major adventure. The Mac Robertson race from England to Melbourne, which coincided with the Melbourne centenary. The start was in England and competitors could fly whenever they liked. This was a seat of your pants stuff and there would be 20 entrants from throughout the world. Britain, Australia, USA, Netherlands, Denmark and New Zealand. There are actually two entries from here and I plan to do a video about the pilot tied up with the second one. Subscribe and you'll get to see it. The map in front of you it gives you the route. After departing RAF Milden Hall, there was a compulsory stops in Baghdad, Alamabad, Singapore, Darwin and Charlesville. Charlesville's in the middle of nowhere, Queensland. These were in essence aviation dumps. Other than that, you were on your own. This is one adventure he wouldn't be on his own. And this is him with his navigator, H.C. Walker. Walker was called Johnny by everyone. He would go on to have a distinguished record in the Pacific and with NAC. They would be flying this. There were two things that distinguished their aircraft. One was it was an open cockpit affair. And two, it had just one 130 horsepower engine. When two seems way more sensible. Spirit of Manawatu was truly a Manawatu affair. The funding came entirely from the pockets of local individuals and businesses. Their trust would be rewarded. And they would finish overall fifth in taking seven days and 14 hours, winning their class and breaking two world records for an aircraft of that size. This was no mean effort. Just 11 of the 20 finished. Of the nine that didn't, five would withdraw due to mechanicals and forward crash. One of those crashes would prove fatal for the two-man British crew. If you're wondering how the other Kiwi got on, they were to finish last. I'll leave that though for another day. Back home in Palmerston North, they put on a civic reception for McGregor and Walker. The pair would go on to tour the country making speeches and were lauded as heroes. We are now into 1935 and the Union Steamship Company thought they would have a crack running the country's first real passenger airline, Union Airways, coming to a North Island town near you. McGregor was recruited to be the airline's services manager. He went off to the States and the UK to see how airlines operated and he had a big say on the aircraft choice. They began operations out of their Palmerston North base in January 1936. The same month he was pictured here with Gene Batten. A few weeks later though, he would be dead at 39. He crashed his Mills monoplane in a gale on a taxi flight at Rongatai Airport, Wellington. Such an innocuous way to die, given all the high-risk ventures he'd undertaken in the past. Such was the admiration from the New Zealand public for McGregor. A nationwide appeal was launched to assist his wife and four children. That raised £5,000. Testament to the respect he had well earned. There is a saying that I like, it's not the years in your life, but the life in your years. Malcolm Charles McGregor packed a lot into his. Thank you all for getting to the end. There was a lot to pack into this one. Watching to the end does help creators like myself. It tells YouTube and punters like the content. I will spot you next time. Bye for now.